Hey, hey guys, how are you? Good morning. I'm I'm feeling better. I'm back back in the ADU, able to once again breathe the free air of not the basement and you know the the air. Can you, so, can you spell out what ADU is for folks that aren't as familiar? Because that's one question I've actually gotten from some local viewers that had no idea what that. That's not a Midwest term. It's not. It's it's a uh, accessory dwelling unit. So uh, they have recently been permitted, and uh, my house had one built. So it's a semi-detached structure that is designed to be rented out. Uh, we got it because my mom, her her memory is uh, touch and go. So um, she stays with us for a fair bit. She stayed with us during the fires, and um, but. For right now, and, and during the pandemic, we've been using it as my uh, recording and, and workspace. And by my, I mean my and my wife's. So uh, Nice. Yeah. See, the difference is I would probably need, it'd be a long walk if I wanted to build an ADU to put in the <laughs> property lot sizes. They're a lot, a lot different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How are you doing, Dean? Good, thanks. Yeah, good. Are you guys going to get any effects from Teddy up in New England, or is that mainly like Nova Scotia? Is it too far east? Uh, it's a little bit too far to the east of us, but we'll get a, a fair bit of storm surge and some pretty strong rips around the Cape and Islands. But it's a pretty fast-moving one, so I expect we'll get hit with something. We generally get a little bit of a, a northeasterly effect once hurricanes move past the coast. Yeah, I saw um, Nova Scotia is simultaneously under a frost warning. Yeah, yeah, and a hurricane warning. Yeah, it's like we've we've, uh, we've we've had frost hit us the last three mornings in a row, so the. The growing season's almost done for us. We had a freeze, so yeah. we're going to rip all of our plants out this weekend. So yeah. um, I'm going to get us started here in about a minute, or actually less, a few seconds. I'm just waiting for folks to join. All right. Uh, no, but yeah, fall is definitely in the air. Yeah. Yeah, first day, right? Today or yesterday? Mm -hmm. First day of fall? I think, I think it was yesterday, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's officially, uh, I don't drink pumpkin beer or Oktoberfest or any of that stuff until it fall starts. And they're already putting Christmas beer on the shelf. So, um, it on comes that earlier note, every year, Ken. It it earlier year. every year. Season creep. All right, so on that note, I want to welcome everyone to our live weekly DAT IQ market update. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics at DAT, joined by the autumnal Ned Damon. <laughs> who is our principal data scientist, and Dean Croak, who's our principal industry analyst. Welcome, guys. Howdy. I, I feel like I really need an orange sweater to qualify as a tumnal, but uh, I'll, I'll bust out the sweaters from storage and be, be back in, in fighting fall shape before you know it. For sure. I think we're all technically a tumnal at this point. I think it's even past the international date line. So, um, all right. We have some really exciting things to talk about this week. So I'm going to walk us through our key points of the week. And after I do that, Dean is going to take us through all of the supporting detail behind those key points of the week. Ned is going to cover the forecast. And again, uh, 2020 continues to 2020. So I'm really excited to hear what we have. Oh, boy. Here. Um, and then Dean found something really interesting in the data that is going to help answer one of our DAT IQ questions. And then we'll wrap up with some questions from our live audience. So without further ado, I'm going to transition to key points of the week. Um, so defying all logic and reason, pretty much, uh, spot rates continue to inch higher, uh, week over week. You know, we are seeing, that's mainly for van. We are seeing some of the wind come out of the sails for reefer and flatbed. And Dean will cover that more in a minute. Um, spot market load posts are increasing and truck posts are climbing. And again, we're going to cover that a little later because that's an interesting, um, little phenomena that we're not used to seeing. Um, and then the cast report came out yesterday, I think it was, um, or the day before, right, right, Dean? And, um, you know, shipments fell, um, and that's going to be interesting to study because all of these different aggregate metrics have different composition statistics, so they might be heavily weighted towards one vertical or another. Um, so we're going to hopefully have some time at the end to discuss what that means, as well as ATA and the DAT numbers and other um, industry metrics. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean to get us started. Thanks, Ken. Uh, yes, yeah, so this week's market update on the supply and demand side, we'll start off with the dry van load to truck ratio. Uh, dropped slightly last week to 5.19, just a slight downward movement. What was interesting this week was that truck posts increased at a faster rate than load posts. Uh, truck posts increased by about 16%, load posts increased by about 13%. And they're currently tracking really closely 
to 2017, which we'll cover a little bit later. There's some interesting uh, correlations there. On the refrigerated side, load board activity, uh, not dissimilar to dry ban. Uh, load posts increased um, by about 5% last week. It was offset by a 12% increase in truck posts. Uh, I think a lot of carriers are taking advantage of the high spot market rates at this point in time and, and posting their trucks for availability. On the flatbed side, um, the flatbed increased again. Uh, it was due to outbound load posts, which dropped about 22% though. Truck posts also increased by 14% to offset that. Um, all three equipment types, interestingly, are tracking very closely to 2017 in terms of seasonality. And that was when uh, we started the 2018 rate rally that, that lasted for about seven months. So this time of the year in 17 was when things started to take off. We're going to be watching that very closely to see if there's any similarities there as we head towards Q4. Moving over to the market condition index on the dry band side, uh, lots of market imbalance, as you can see by the colours uh, variation. Some markets are very hot, some are cold. Uh, Ken mentioned cash freight shipment index, uh, which is down 7.6% year over year. But interestingly, there was an increase from July to August. So things are improving. Uh, on the demand side, a lot of load board activity in the hurricane affected markets along the Florida and Gulf Coast. Uh, those volumes around the whole panhandle of Gulf Coast markets were up about 22% week over week. Uh, on the West Coast, very strong volumes also in the Pacific Northwest as we were into the fall produce season. In Ontario and Los Angeles, a lot of activity in dry van. They posted a 16% week over week increase and about 18% week over week increase up in San Francisco. Uh, Houston, uh, which was uh, the big mover of the week uh, in, the, in the South, they reported a 30% week over week increase in load posts. Moving over to the refrigerated. Uh, Before market. you move to reefer, I don't want to slow your roll here. Um, You're right. I think the one thing that really jumps out at me is, other than is that Laredo and LA, Ontario, those are the only two spots of red, essentially west, I mean, that in Houston, I mean, west of Houston. So what, I mean, that's kind of running a, a little bit contrary to what we've been seeing in prior weeks and months. I mean, are we seeing more just centralized port activity or, you know, what else explains that? Uh, imports, exports, the imbalance, the deficit between US and Mexico uh, increased again this week. So in imports are increasing at a much faster rate than exports. So that's creating more activity through the largest commercial zone, uh, which is Laredo. That's the big one. So we see a lot of imports come through there for a lot of the retail freight that we're seeing in CPG. So a lot of those, a lot of the retail season stocking up also comes from the southern border. Same effect in Los Angeles and Ontario with that big surge in imports that uh, General Commerce reported a few weeks ago where they, they said that volumes were up about 34% over the summer ending August. Yeah, it'd be really interesting, maybe for a future show, um, a lot of folks probably don't know, we actually have MCI, both inbound and outbound. This one's all outbound. It'd be interesting to see if some of those um, inbound markets are flaring up uh, a little bit to kind of show the head haul back haul dynamic, right? Yeah, they're certainly appearing on the southern border. Uh, there's certainly certainly less freight going into the market, which which is creating capacity shortage. There is some upward movement in rates, but there's still a, a plenty of available capacity along that market. I haven't been seeing any significant upward rate movement just yet. All right, cool, thanks. All right, so back to the refrigerated market conditions index. Uh, we're still seeing it driven by a lot of fall produce. Uh, I've been tracking the USDA domestic truckload shipments. That's a really good barometer for how well the, the domestic produce season's been doing. Hasn't been doing as well this year as a result of the pandemic. Domestic and imported truckload shipments, and a lot of those imports come from the southern border. Uh, they were down 22% last week compared to the same week in 2019. 22% translates to about 7,700 fewer loads of produce, which is a lot. But that's been offset, and this is the one of the outcomes of the pandemic, the, the drop in produce volumes has been offset by a very strong retail season in frozen food. Um, the IRA data shows that uh, frozen food sales are up about 18% year over year, and they're the best selling product line of any of the temperature controlled zones in the supermarkets. And of course, that's because consumers want longer, life, uh, longer shelf life food and make fewer trips to the market. Um, notable markets this week, Ken, um, southern border again, as we just talked about, uh, there was about an 18% increase week over week in load posts along the entire southern border, especially in the Rio Grande Valley and McAllen. A lot of lettuce, zucchini and peppers are pumping out of there, as well as watermelons. Tucson reported a 36% increase week over week, uh, and interestingly, 14% of those loads out of Tucson, which is a long way away from Hunts Point, that's exactly where they were headed into the, into the Brooklyn market. 
Uh, not a lot of ra upward rate pressure in reef reefer other than uh, something in the 1% to 3% range. So nothing significant, but a little bit of upward rate pressure. Flatbed's very different. Still a lot of uh, heat in the market driven by rebuilding efforts and recent hurricanes and fires and the continuation of demand uh, in more rural areas as people look to relocate from cities because of the pandemic and work from home in new homes that are more conducive to working from that location. Uh, carriers we spoke to this week report that they've never been busier or more profitable, and that's even more so than in 2018. Uh, a lot of this is being fueled by new housing starts. About half of those occur in the south southwest. New housing starts were up about 4% in, in August, and that puts new home starts up about 12% year over year for carriers that are hauling machinery, construction material, lumber, building materials, etc. So that's the market condition index. Let's have a quick look at the rate side of the market. Dean, I'm going to jump in again. I'm sorry. You're, you're probably yeah. going to get upset at my... Uh interjections here. Um, we had a question come in, I think rather than circling back, just given that you're on the topic, I think it'd be a good time to go ahead and answer mm -hmm. it. Um, this one comes from Derek and it says, can you dive into what hot and cold means for a broker specifically um, on these heat maps? Uh, hot and cold simply means that the market is, uh, you know, the brighter the red, the tighter the capacity and the more up and pressure on rates and the reverse applies for the cooler, darker colors. Yeah, so in a hotter market, you might expect to have to make more phone calls or call more carriers to get a shipment covered, and you should expect generally to pay higher rates. Yep. In a cooler, bluer market, um, it should be easier to cover the shipment, perhaps less effort, um, and you should get better rates than a hotter market, right? It's all relative, though. It's not yep. Blue isn't absolutely cheaper and red isn't absolutely more expensive. It's just how they play relative to each other, correct? Correct. Yeah, okay. I hope that answers your question, Derek. Great question. Uh, on the spot market uh, year over year uh, rate review for dry van rates, you can see the, the upward right hand uh, directional movement of the spot rates. They're still moving up. They ended about $2.22 per mile last week. This is 43% higher than this time last year when rates were at $1.55 a mile. So it's still the highest we've recorded in the last five years. It's the 21st week of successive increases. And rates are up about 90 cents a mile since they bottomed out at the start of the pandemic lockdown period in April. It's absolutely amazing. Similar effect in refrigerated year over year view shows that the rate has still increased, uh, moved up about 1% to $2.38 a mile, uh, but the rate of increases slowed down, as Ken mentioned at the start of the show. It's still the highest level we've seen in five years for this time of the year when rates typically taper off um, compared to 2018 when rates were about $2.41 a mile. So we're not far off that peak uh, during that pretty busy period that we we all live through. Um, and lastly, flatbed rates uh, definitely are cooling off here. They stayed relatively flat last week, uh, only moved up about one cent per mile to $2.17. There was a lot of uh, fl fluctuation over the week. And rates now are about four cents a mile higher than where they were in 2018 for this time of the year when they were $2.15. Uh, spot rates have increased here, as you can see, strong upward trend uh, left to right. They've increased about 57 cents a mile since the, since the bottoming out period uh, in in early April uh, towards late May. So that's the market update for supply and demand. Over to you, Ned, for the rate forecast. Thank you, Dean. Uh, so we're going to be looking at our forecast models. We have a couple of them that we run every week. So uh, this chart, the blue line is our market rates observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you can see um, before what we call the model spaghetti. Uh, green is our flagship rate cast model. Red is our more short term looking uh, short term model. And then the blended forecasts in yellow or gold and uh, gray are mixtures of these two models in different amounts and in different ways. Uh, you can see that the short term model for dry van is expecting uh, the up and to the right to continue. Uh, given the track record, um, I feel like that's pretty reasonable, although at some point reality is going to reassert itself. Um, but it, it, it's just kind of a question of when. And then um, the rate cast model is expecting uh, the seasonal pattern of tapering off into the fall to happen. Uh, the blended forecasts are somewhere in the middle for that. Moving forward to reefer rates, uh, and something that I forgot to mention, but I should mention also about this, is that there's a fair bit of model divergence, where uh, when the models agree, that typically makes me happy. When they disagree, it's important to figure out why. And I think the, the big contributor to these guys is seasonality, is that the short-term model um, effectively thinks that the seasonal trends are broken, whereas the, the rate cast model is expecting the seasonal trends to reassert themselves. And uh, 
I, th I think I'm going to leave it as an exercise to the viewer about uh, whether or not that that is the case. Uh, Ned, but, with the seasonality, you bring up a good point. Yeah. So I'm surprised in that regard to see the green line, which is rate cast, right? Not starting to tail up a little bit as we head into late October, because that first part of the M that is retail peak, right? The, mm -hmm. the double top, it usually happens around Thanksgiving or not Thanksgiving, uh, Halloween. Right. Um, is it because we've overshot the expected seasonality so much that it's almost like trying to regress back down to what the seasonal average would have been? Yes. Or how can you explain? Yes, that I mean that oh. that that that's that's the long and short of it is that uh, these rates are much higher than the rate cast model is comfortable with, uh, and so it's expecting there to be some kind of like a longer term correction to to pull things back down towards the the overall median rates over the last uh, over its training period. Um, Chalk that I up think, to a lucky guess, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I think overall um, that's going to happen at some point. Because um, what you saw after 2018, for example, uh, with the ELD mandate drawing rates higher and then and then them coming back down, at some point they will come back down. But um, you know when and how is I think the operative question. Um, anyway, to go back, uh, we were looking at reefer. So the blue line uh, in this chart is the uh, observed historical market rates by DAT, and then we've got our. Um, models off to the right, you can see there's a little bit less divergence in reefer that's due to the, the slowing that you expected from Dean, but still there, there's broad uh, spread by the time you're getting out into uh, October. Um, finally, we are moving to flatbed. Again, the blue line is the market rates observed by DAT, and then you have our uh, rate cast model are, uh, in green, our short-term model in red, and our two blended forecasts in gold and gray. Here, again, there's model divergence, there's model agreement for the first two weeks, and then it diverges as you're moving into middle of October. Um, and uh, here, I think that the blended forecasts are, are capturing some of that slowing trajectory that, that uh, we're seeing. But uh, I have had a bad track record betting against the short-term model, and so I'm not I'm not willing to to make any bets. Uh, and that's it for our forecast models. Awesome, thank you, Ned. So for our Ask IQ question this week, I'm just pulling it up real quick to ensure that I got the wording. So um, the, the the just the question is, how are we seeing post and search dynamics? change both on the load and truck side um, this far into COVID, right? I mean, we, we've seen the first couple shocks and reverberations, but we've been in this a while now. I think we can all attest to the fact that um, we've been in this for the long haul and we don't necessarily see light immediately at the end of the tunnel. So to answer that question, I was going to turn it over to Dean because he's pulled some really interesting data. Um, and I think has some great insight on this. Yeah. One of the things that got my attention this week, Ken, was that for the first time in in a long time, as far back as I could see, the number of total load posts and truck posts for the three equipment types both increased at the same rate. So they both increased about 15% week over week, which is kind of unusual because normally there's an inverse relationship between the two. As, as you can see on the chart here, uh, when, when load posts are increasing, in particular in that late 2017 period through 2018 period, you could see that the number of trucks searching for loads decrease, which is which is fairly normal. You should see, uh, you know, capacity start to tighten um, as the number of, as the volume increases in the market. So that, that switched over in late 2018 when we started to see capacity start to loosen all the way through 2019. You can see that blue line starting to drop down and the gap widen. So as the, as the number of loads decreased into 2019 on the spot market, the number of trucks searching for loads increased to its highest point in, in early 2019. And anecdotally, we heard in the market that there was an oversupply of capacity, and that capacity was looking for freight to haul. And of course, we saw it kind of bumped along fairly uh, evenly, like the spread was pretty much the same. But then in, uh, during the pandemic, there was this massive volatility. This is one of the things we're trying to understand is what's driving this? Is it simply the spot market? is attracting more carriers to that rate and contract carriers are not honoring their contract commitments? Or is it because uh, trucks are more dislocated into the market? Uh, we've heard from carriers that they're ending up in areas that they wouldn't normally be in because there's a lot of new origin destination pairs emerging in the market as new warehouses pop up. And, and does that mean they're actually searching for more loads on a load board 
because they're trying to cover that increased length of haul. So there's some of the variables that we're looking at at the moment. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, looking at this chart, I don't know if, uh, if we can get it back up or not, but um, hopefully it's still fresh in everyone's memory. Um, it's just, if you, it's remarkable, right? If you look at like weeks 12, 13, 14, 15, mm -hmm. um, we saw kind of a historical low mm -hmm. posts and a historical high truck post in the same week. And we can kind of tie that back, right, mentally to mm -hmm. um, social distancing and when everything really kind of clamped down for those few weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then just protests keep, in Washington. Yeah, you know, a few weeks yeah. prior, you see um, loads were spiking um, due to the restocking and the toilet paper and the paper towels and all the yeah. bottled water. So yeah. um, I think that's why historical context is so important, right? I mean, we we apply a lot of science and a lot of really sound an analytics to this, but ultimately it's like we look at to get to this point and then we look at it and like see what our experiences were and what was happening in the market then mm -hmm. so that we can, when things like that happen again, we can kind of read the tea leaves um, and use that to make the best decisions when we experience those market conditions um, in the future, right? Yeah, I mean, that. I think that's that's part of the the art of forecasting is that, um, and, and just sort of understanding conditions is that uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes and understanding why and how the rhyme is happening allows you to understand what ways it's likely to move forward in the future. And here, you know, like the, the, the clearest, rhyme that you kind of get is the 2018 ELD mandate. When that happened, uh, there was kind of a loss of throughput, right? Because the drivers couldn't uh, go quite as far as they could. And I think that social distancing has, and and just the general COVID and dislocation has those kind of rhymes to uh, a loss of throughput. One of the things we're also looking at, guys, is the search behavior um, as trucks search for loads. Uh, anecdotally, we've heard drivers are broadening their net so they're, they're searching for loads with a wider deadhead. Uh, that's one of the things we're trying to establish, establish through the data science uh, team is to see if that's in fact changed the behaviour. We've heard from some of the large truckload carriers through their recent earnings calls that they're doing uh, more deadhead miles and more trips per week. doesn't necessarily translate to higher revenue per tractor week, but they're doing more trips. But of those, some of those trips are empty because they're trying to reposition their trucks into different markets to keep their lanes balanced as, as best they can. Sure. Uh, do you think it's time for some viewer questions? I do. Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Maxim, and his question was, uh, what happened to the market for the last three or four weeks? Uh, why are rates so high this time? I can maybe kick that one off. You know, I think uh, they were the high the last three to four weeks, right? Because they were really high the three to four weeks prior to that, and they've continued right. to, to grow. I think... The one, of the one of the things I think we need to do a better job of stressing better on this program is like we talk a lot about national rates because we have 20 to 30, if we're lucky, minutes to connect with everyone during the week. But there are, you know, we track internally 18,225 lane combinations for three different equipment types. And buried in all of that data, there's going to be a lot more interesting things going on, whether it's head haul, back haul dynamic, you know, whether it's kind of tri haul routes or if we can start to tease out relay patterns in the data east and west um, going cross country. So a couple of the things that we've seen uh, in the last three to four weeks, we've really seen, and Dean's touched on this, head haul, back haul dynamic yeah. really pop up. If you look at like LA to Denver, it's up pushing up against $4 a mile and Denver to LA is at 90 some cents with fuel. So if you're only seeing one leg of that run pop up on a load offer, um, it's gonna look really weird compared to what you may have saw four, five, six weeks ago. Uh, Dean, you had a great example of... Uh, yeah. Yeah, on the uh, Los Angeles to Dallas lane, right, it's a pretty high volume lane for a lot of freight that lands in Los Angeles, both from uh, air cargo and uh, in inbound imports via the sea. Uh, Los Angeles to Dallas line haul rates have tripled since April when they were $1.11 per mile. Then now it's $3.26 a mile. But there's a freight imbalance back in the other direction. So if you're running just origin to destination back to origin, you'd still be running at around $2.10 a mile. But because the outbound load from Dallas back to Los Angeles is paying substantially less. So you'd be wanting to look for a tri haul option to do that. You know, in other markets, Ken, Buffalo to Charlotte, it's a market we don't talk about a lot. It's a smaller market um, out of Buffalo, but you're running at $2.56 a mile. 
you know, well above the national average, just on certain lanes. So it's not just the national average. There's a lot of volatility in the market depending on where trucks are and where loads are and where that particular region is uh, during the lockdown uh, reopening process. Yeah, and if you're a contract carrier, let's think about that for a minute. Um, even if the routing guide's holding, let's just say that you have a theoretical routing guide of five carriers. Mm -hmm. The third, fourth, and fifth carrier are there for a reason. They're generally more expensive than the first and second carrier. So, you know, we use these terms, the routing guides are holding. You know, they might not be moving off their routing guide to the spot market, mm -hmm. but they may be moving down the routing guide. So let's just say, again, theoretically for easy math, it's a nickel. Mm -hmm. per mile every time you move down the routing guide you know if you get to your third carrier um that's 10 to 15 cents higher than the top carrier and you really haven't shifted much you're still on your rates that were put in place a while ago you're just shifting more freight further down the routing guide mm -hmm. um, and of course we are um seeing things um spilling off into the spot market obviously i think we the, the latest fmic number we had and we should get new ones here shortly um 22 to 25 percent right ned dean check me on that of that sounds right spot market. yep all right. Uh, we have another question from Nara Simhamurthy. Uh, any pointers to find out the number of trucks in a particular state as such? And the recommendation I would have is our hot market maps and our MCI products uh, for like commercial products have that information. Uh, if you want it on like a more regular data feed or you're interested in diving into the data further, um, the data analytics services group um, uh, here, um, Alex Perry specifically is a, a good human to talk to. Uh, and he's... Uh, in addition to being just a good human to talk to generally, he's also uh, got those those numbers for folks that need it. Yeah, we also have lane breakers too, right? If you're not looking for yes. trucks in a market, you can look at carriers that have historically moving, moving, moved freight on a certain lane um, over a certain period of time to kind of really understand. Let's say that you've been awarded some new freight going from LA to Dallas. That's a terrible example because it's such a high traffic lane. But let's just say you can go into lane makers and search and see all of the carriers moving freight on that lane. Um, and then look them up in our directory um, to get in touch. So, um, you know, it's a great way to, to to really understand both what's going on in the market now and then how kind of how those trucks and why those trucks are there um, at the moment. Do we have time for one more question, do you think, Ken? I think we have time for a couple. We've only been here for 28 minutes. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Rob C. asks, how do you think the Amazon effect is going to impact rates over the next eight weeks? Um, I've said this so many times in the past two weeks. I'm very thankful that I'm not in pricing at a large oh, barrier right now um, or capacity management. I think the real question is going to be how do these networks that they put in place hold, right? So mm -hmm. they have a game plan going into peak as does FedEx and UPS and probably DHL and to a lesser extent the post office. But um, of how much they want to move through their network, how much overflow they want to utilize, um, where they want the bulk to go, where they want to break bulk. And, and these are all industry terms to say, like, how do they want to downsize the freight until ultimately that nifty new can opener lands on your door that you found on Black Friday, right? So if you think about the journey that that t-shirt or can opener or widget made from being manufactured in Southeast Asia, move on a boat, landed, drayed, put on a train, put on a truck, move to a warehouse, move to a distribution center, and then put on a parcel truck and delivered, they all have a game plan of how much they want in each of those buckets. And I think this retail season is going to test all of that. It's going to test conventional thinking. It's going to test the plans that they put in place even in response to COVID. So um, key things to look for are going to be port, you know, import volumes, which we're seeing surging. A lot of that stuff probably has already landed, but there's still probably a lot more to come. Um, truckload volumes heading east, typical distribution center areas in your network and in general are going to be key to watch over the next few weeks to see how that stuff's going from the large DCs to maybe like the frontline DCs. Um, and then ultimately, you know, you know, the e-commerce balance, we'll start to see some of those numbers reported for August and September, um, how those two months com compared. And I think that'll be a really good bellwether heading into the fall, but I'm sure I missed something. Anything you'd like to add, Matt or Dean? Yeah, one thing I'd like to add, just from the capacity point of view, we kind of covered this last week, but it still persists uh, in that there's a, a imbalance between inbound truckload shipments and outbound uh, next day delivery shipments. You know, if you think about a, a warehouse with two sides of it in a fulfillment centre, you've got all this inbound volume coming in uh, with a lot of it being imported freight, and then you've got this massive congestion, and then you've got this pressure to push out smaller consignments 
out the other dock uh, for next day or, or second day delivery. Anecdotally, still hearing from carriers that there's lots of delays on the inbound side, which is affecting their utilisation levels, and, and that could have an effect on prices or, or total transport costs as you add in accessorial costs such as layover and detention pay. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing that I would I kind of add to that is that um, to the extent that we're seeing trouble uh, having the sort of traditional patterns reassert themselves, whenever you're having a huge volume of freight going through, it's to, to echo Ken's point, it's really going to test things. And to the extent that you can ameliorate those with rates, uh, it'll be interesting to see. And to the extent you can, right? It, yeah. the railroads on the West Coast are having a, I mean, they're basically saying no. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if by the end of the month they're requiring, you know, wheelbarrows of gold bullion to, to get stuff loaded <laughs> you know, from a third capacity. And that might not get it on the train to head. Right. Um, so. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the question is, you know, to the extent money helps to make more trucks move things, but you have to have the trucks. Yeah. But that's compounded by westbound rates are fairly low. So actually yeah. getting the capacity to the West Coast is, is an even mm -hmm. bigger challenge. For sure. We have an anonymous question. Uh, what should I be looking for if I'm dealing with reefers? I think we can touch on that one real quick. Um, you know, MCI, reefer load to truck, and then kind of the historical rate trends and seasonality, I think are all important. I'm interested to get your take on this, Dean. But my thoughts are I think we're going to have a little bit of a, a bearish push through the fall and winter for reefers just due to like schools, maybe not. I mean, they still might be up due to COVID, but I just don't know that you're going to, I would suspect they're going to decouple a bit if they haven't already from drive vans, yep. just due to some of the lower demand from mm -hmm. any sporting events, schools, yep. um, universities. I, I just think you're going to have a little bit of deflationary pressures through the fall. Yeah. Produce season's already starting to, to dwindle. Um, I think, you know, frozen food's only a, a certain part of it, but I think the bigger number is on the demand side, especially in food services. Uh, this week there was a report out from the National Retail Federation that something like 60% of restaurants are either shut down and, and won't come back to business ever again. Um, you know, the, here, here in Boston, one of the largest uh, bartending services, their year over year revenue is down 80%. Um, you know, same in my wife's catering business. Um, you know, big colleges are not, not running uh, outside events or even inside events for that matter. So I think that's going to drive a lot of the refrigerated demand until it gets really cold, Ken, because once it gets really cold, then you'll start to see the protect, protect from freeze come in to stop dry freight from freezing. And that yep. drives up a little bit of demand in sort of January, February period. But it'll be pretty quiet, I think, in Q4. For sure. We have a question from Alejandro. Do you think that with unemployment still being as high as it is, it can cause uh, an increase of drivers to come into the market? That one's all Dean. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've uh, we've been tracking the number of new entrants into the market in terms of number of power units and drivers uh, since August. The industry's added about thirty six thousand new vehicles since uh, since April one. So there's definitely been an influx of new trucks into the market and new drivers into the market. So I think, um, in particular, since the six hundred dollars a week benefits started to fall away in July, there's definitely been an increase in activity in that area. Uh, I would say that now would be a great time to be joining the market, particularly uh, with rates so strong. Uh, there'll certainly be plenty of demand for carriers in the smaller fleets. Yeah, I think the question is like, what what happens just to kind of end, you know, what happens with the kind of like this, I, I think of like spot is like the variable at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do we see meaningful and systemic increases in contract rates? Because that's what'll, I mean, mm -hmm. if you join the market now, you're going to benefit from these spot rates, but we all know how quickly that can turn. The question is, do these spot rates drive higher contract rates, which will help them over the next 12 to 18 months? Right. Um, well, I think this time, Ken's very different. We've, we've seen smaller fleets grow at a, a much higher rate. You know, there's been something like 11,000 UN operators join the industry since April, uh, but not nearly as many company drivers have come on in the large mega fleets. So I think the large capacity fleets have certainly uh, tightened up their capacity. And, and I could understandably uh, see why they would want to do that, given the, the lack of uh, uh, certainty about demand. I think carriers mm -hmm. have learned their lesson from 2018 and are definitely not adding capacity as fast as demand is increasing this time around. I think it's also interesting. Um, we have a hypothesis that I've been trying to track down at, at DAT for a couple of years, and I haven't been able to find much proof of it one way or another. And that is uh, this idea of seasonal um, 
carriers where you have people who work in the construction industry or who work in other industries and then they they uh, truck when the, the rates are favorable. And I think that this is a perfect test case to see whether or not um, these these folks are a significant enough uh, contributor to the capacity base to, to affect rates. Because, you know, if I had a truck that was idle a lot of the time, I definitely want to come in now. There's a, there's a lot of fleets now that have multiple trailers. So mm -hmm. um, I've got friends of mine here in New England that'll be hauling uh, waste trailers, dump trailers, and then flatbeds at different times of the year. You know, one of the really good indicators is when you see the the, the band season and the, the theatre season start to ramp up and you'll see a lot of guys with uh, headache racks on the back of their trucks hauling dry vans waiting outside a music centre. You don't need a headache rack to haul the dry van. It's because normally they haul a drop deck or a, or a flatbed mm -hmm. with lumber. So you see a lot of interchange. A lot of guys um, offer their power up to different markets as the season, um, you know, changes from from winter through fall into uh, back into summer. Yeah, I'm going to end in one second before um, our producer jumps through the screen and attacks me. Um, I had a really great conversation. I'm just going to spend 10 seconds on this. My supposition was that trailer, trailer utilization would be way down. And I talked to one of the largest um, asset-based carriers in the country last week, and they said it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. Retailers are so hungry to get that freight on the shelves yep. that they're moving through trailers and unloading at record paces. They're actually hiring supplemental dock help, um, you know, even contracted dock, dock help to help move that stuff through. So maybe we can dive into that one next week. Yeah. I know we actually have questions pending. But just for the sake of time, we're going to wrap up. If you um, have any specific questions that are really pressing, ask IQ at DAT.com. Uh, myself, Ned, Dean, and a bunch of other folks on our staff monitor that and are able to answer it. Like and subscribe. Uh, it's the best way to know when we go live and push content out there. And we'll hope to get, we've written some of those questions down. We'll hope to cover them on the live show next week. And then the last thing I will cover is Dean's market update. It's a long form written version with a lot more charts and graphs than what we talked about here. I think it's excellent. Um, we know that there's tons of people viewing that because when it's not up at the exact moment that it was last week, we hear about it. So that's always <laughs> really good news. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Really great engagement this week. We love, I could sit here and answer these questions all morning. I caffeinated um, to go until at least noon. So this is good. Um, so with that, we will see you next week. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye, all.